Bernina is sponsoring this episode. Why not transform a thrift store pair of jeans into a cute jumper or a men's shirt into a cool wrap dress? With a new Bernina 3 Series sewing machine, you'll be saying, D.I., why not? Both the B335 and the B325 come standard with the Bernina legendary stitch quality we all love. And these machines are packed with innovative features, easily handle a variety of tougher, tricky fabrics, and are an absolute cinch to use. New and seasoned stitchers alike love these machines. Find a store near you at Bernina.com and bring home your Bernina 3 Series machine today. Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm the editor, Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by... Hi, I'm Carol Frazier, Senior Technical Editor. Hi, I'm Janine Clegg, Managing Editor, Production. And our special guest today is Ellen W. Miller. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here, Ellen. Ellen is an embellishment expert, a teacher, and an author. She wrote the beautiful book, Creating Couture Embellishment. Very nice. It was in our gift guide last year. It was published in 2017, and it's a timeless reference for garment embellishing techniques. And we also have some of her garments in the background here. Ellen has shared some of the techniques in her book through her classes, and last year in an article for Threads on Sutosh Trim, which featured this jacket right back here. Ellen is a former instructor at the Boston School of Fashion and a theater costumer. Well, thanks again for being here, Ellen. My pleasure. Now, we start uh, every episode with a few questions for the special guest. So, first of all, who taught you to sew? First, my mother. Although she was not a very good seamstress, she was a great lawyer, but not a terrific seamstress. And then a variety of people in the theater, but really my teacher at the School of Fashion Design in Boston, Louise Cushing, taught me so much. I will be forever grateful to her. But I'd also like to add to that, that when I was in Brownies, I did not get my sewing badge because I could not hand sew the hems on the napkins. It was beyond <laughs> my ability. So I flunked my Brownie sewing badge. <laughs> so even if you flunked your Brownie sewing badge, you too could learn to sew professionally. <laughs> I don't Early think they failures. Have a sewing badge. <laughs> Early failures bring later success, yeah. right? <laughs> not a good predictor of what's to come. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, what's your favorite sewing term? When I was teaching at the School of Fashion Design one year, I had a number of students from Korea. And at the end of each demonstration, these two young women would go off to the side and I'd hear them speaking in Korean, which I don't speak or understand. And so one day I thought, that's it. I'm going to go over and tell them at the end of the lecture demonstration, they need to be working on their projects, not talking about what they did last night. So I went charging over. I was all puffed up and ready to, you know. And I hear them talking and moving a piece of fabric, and one of them says, catchy stitchy. And I had just demonstrated the catch stitch. So all the wind went right out of my sails, but I love the word catchy stitchy. <laughs> what are you currently sewing? Right now, I'm trying to get back to knit fabrics. I spent so many years working on the book and just doing wovens. So I'm trying to get back to knits, and it's it's a slow process for me because it I just need to rejigger everything in my head to go from one from wovens to knits. knits. Is it something for yourself? Is it Yes. Oh, like a, a new a shirt or a dress. Um, we had a ASDP local challenge. So everybody in our local new in the New England group um, made a shirt. The same shirt and we all made it slightly differently. So if you go on to the ASDP website, the New England chapter, you can see us all in our shirts. They oh, all yes. came out very differently. So it was really fun to do that. Oh, sure. And we should just mention, in case anyone in the audience doesn't know, that's the Association of Sewing and Design Professionals. Right. Yeah. What's your favorite fabric to sew? I love to sew silk dupioni. Oh, yes. It's, I love the combination of the texture, and you can make it crisp or you can make it soft. And it 
the seam allowances do tend to fray, but if you just know that going in and, um, and it just, I love the way it looks. And what do you love most about sewing? I love taking a flat piece of fabric and molding it into something that goes around a body and somehow makes that body able to stand up straight and proud and feel better about themselves. I mean, I'm assuming that the garment is perfectly fit because that's what we do. And um, I just love how it can transform your client or myself in the actual making of the garment. Yes, you get to make something that can then transform somebody, somebody else. else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. love that, both parts of it. Yes. So, so thanks, Ellen. We're going to take a brief break, and then we'll be right back to talk more about your book. Thank you. Threads Insider, our online membership, is for every sewer, and it just got better. Membership now includes digital access to every issue, home delivery of the print magazine, unlimited access to videos, tutorial posts, projects, and pattern templates on our website. Visit threadsmagazine.com insider to learn more. And we're back. We're here today with Ellen W. Miller, and we're going to talk about her wonderful book, Creating Couture Embellishment. Great now, book. Ellen, Thank when you. I first met you, you told me a little bit about this, the story behind the book, but for the benefit of our listeners, how did it come about? Um, there was a confluence of, of good uh, happenstances that all came together. Boy, was that badly put anyway. <laughs> um, I needed to take some time off from my teaching job because my mom was sick and I needed to spend more time taking care of her. And Lawrence King Publishing sent an email to, I assume, a bunch of fashion schools asking if they had any teachers who had an idea for a book. And so I wrote back and said, oh, yes, I have this idea for a book. And it was based on a class I taught there called Couture Details. And they wrote back and said, oh, this would be great. And then on their website, they have a whole bunch of um, author requirements. And so I filled out all the author requirement things and sent it in, and it was accepted. So that's how the book came about. When did that process start, and, and how long a process was it to the, um, you had the actual book? Um, when, after the contract was signed, um, they, Lawrence King sent an editor to Boston who I met with, Anne Townley, who is a wonderful, wonderful woman. And we thought, oh, 24 chapters, I should be able to do that in two years. That would be a chapter a month. That would be fine. Seems fine. Well, two years turned into five years. <laughs> and so um, it, it really took five years to write the 400 pages. And there are lots of contributing reasons, but the main one was I had to learn how to take pictures of each step along the way. And I could, so I would take the first set of pictures doing the steps, and then I'd go to my computer to write the steps, to write the instructions, and I'd realize, oh, that shot doesn't really show the thread very well, or I took a picture two stitches too soon or two stitches too late for the picture and the text. They didn't match up, and so then I would go back, and for me, I had to go back all the way to the beginning and re-photograph the whole sequence. I couldn't start in the middle of the sequence and move forward. I had to go all the way back to the beginning. So I would go back to the beginning and re-photograph it. It is a painstaking process. It I, is. But I can really appreciate that in the finished book. The, yeah. the photographs are very beautiful. Thank you. And how many techniques did you cover in the book? I think there are 174. Wow. <laughs> I, I think that's right. Um, I, someone else has counted it up, but I don't. I sort of lost track after a while. Um, I think it says on the back. Well, it's but it is anyway. It go clearly. It's a painstaking process because you can see all of the the many steps, the many photographs, and they're very clear. And you really get a sense of what to do. Even if you don't want to read the words, you look at the photos, and that helps you tremendously. But 
both together are, are wonderful. And you cover such a wide variety of, to- of embellishment techniques. Yeah. Um, everything from grommets to right. Uh, ruffles, right? Right. right. <laughs> I tried to put in as many different techniques as I could think of in the book. Um, In the end, three chapters were cut. We didn't put in crochet. Uh, We ran out of room. There are 400 pages, and we ran out of room. So we didn't put in crochet. We didn't put in a chapter called Finishing Details, which was um, buttons and um, hems and... Uh, buttonholes and things like that, special hem techniques, and um, needle felting didn't make the cut either. So someday maybe we'll have an appendix that'll be just those three chapters or maybe another couple of techniques added in. You never know. (laughs) And are you you working on another book now or do you have um, thoughts on one? I'm thinking about another book, which I vowed I would never do again. (laughs) <laughs> after the five-year project right right, right. after the five-year project I said that's it it's really lonely writing a book because your eye was always at the sewing machine at the camera or at the computer and so um, I spent a lot of time alone so I would not like to do that again but I am thinking about writing a book about designing clothes for for women of a certain age and and just rethinking what our bodies look like because they keep changing um, and, you know, sort of simple design elements, not complicated, just simple as opposed to this. <laughs> <laughs> With that, are you thinking that that would have patterns included in it or, or mm-hmm. sort of ideas about how you would deal, work with more patterns that you can find or it more about taking a croquis of uh-huh. yourself and then working with that okay so you learn what works better on your figure right or your client's figure right um but the whole thing may come to naught i don't know yet i'm not i'm still exploring it and i don't know so we'll see how did that idea come to you um it's a part of my life that I, I always said, oh, I'm not a designer. I'm a technician. I'm a teacher. I'm a really good teacher. And my background is in technical theater. Um, and I did learn how to design things when I went to design school, but that was not my primary focus. So I always said, oh, I'm not a designer. And... Um, but then I was forced to design a couple of things, and I, I really do know how to design things. And so I wanted to take that, oh, look, I really can do this. I do know how to do this. And um, put it out in a way that encourages everybody else to rely on what they know already and what they can see. Even if it's not about clothing, you can see, okay, that fruit display looks really appealing. Okay, so let's, what makes that appealing? Now let's switch that a little bit and make it into what makes this top look appealing. They're not so different. They're still about repetition and um, shapes and colors. And that's what clothing is about. So. It sounds like you really do have a lot of ideas <laughs> about that. I think I think it's an idea that needs to percolate a little more. But yeah, yeah I would yeah. love to it's, see that. It's not ready, but it's. It's getting there. <laughs> but it seems like a fun way to approach your sewing. And because it, it's true that at a certain point in your life, you start thinking, well, I'm a little old for wearing this kind of thing. And I don't have special occasions where I wear gowns very often, if at all. I want something nice every day. What would it be? And how would I make it so that it is fun to make and wear and makes me look good? And that's right where and, we need to go. <laughs> and just because I'm, I mean, personally, I love to play with beads. Mm-hmm. But I don't usually wear them. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate them into my life. I mean, I like things that go in the washing machine and the right. dryer. Yeah. And you think, well, beads don't really fit that mold. But if there's a way, I'm <laughs> going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> that is brings up something that I had a question about after uh, going through the book a little bit. Um, 
how would you recommend people uh, care for garments that have embellishments on them? And you've got beading in there, you have uh, ribbons, you have other um, silk embellishments. How should they care for those garments? Um, Assuming that they added the embellishment to the garment, regardless of whether they made the garment, but assuming that they added the embellishment, before they added it, except for, well, even before they added it, I hope they washed it. So if it's a piece of ribbon or a piece of fabric or even some beads, sometimes the color rubs off a bead if it's a very inexpensive bead. So if you've washed it, then you know that it's washable and you can put it in the washing machine on a very gentle cycle or in a garment bag, you know, one of those lingerie bags, or even just set it in the sink and sort of swish it around by hand and then take it out and lay it flat or lay it on a rack and let it air dry. So, okay. And what about dry cleaning though? Don't don't some beads and some embellishments tarnish or yep. uh, change in some way after yep. because of the dry cleaning? Chemicals? Yes, they yes. do. And some dry cleaners won't accept your garment because it has beads or something else on it because they don't want the responsibility for if the beads break or if they tarnish or all the color comes off of them. So that's why I like to hand wash things. Even if it's wool, um, I think that you can get it wet. You just have to be careful to smooth it out and make it back into the same shape it was when you started. With, of course, lots of careful um, handling of whatever it is you're doing. Right, because sometimes you can't press. Right. I'm thinking of some of the embellishments that you have in there. It's a textured uh, right. embellishment. You don't want right. to press that. Right. You can't press it, but you can s- steam it with an iron. So if you take the iron and you hold it up above the garment, if this is your garment or your embellishment, and you hold it up above and the steam goes in there, and then you can go back and manipulate it with your hands and smooth it, you'd be amazed what you can do with that. Your hands and steam fix a multitude of sins. <laughs> Ellen, how do you store the sample garments from the book? How, how would you store these beautifully embellished garments? Um, most of them I have in um, acid-proof boxes that I got from a, a museum conservation kind of place. Um, they're, they And when I'm really being careful, I would put Um, conservation uh, tissue paper in them and around them. Um, Acid-free, acid-free paper. uh, Acid-free paper. We did did a story about that, and the exact issue is not coming to mind right now, but we can put it in the show notes for this episode about where to get those supplies. Yeah, Yeah. I know that Uline sells them because that's where I bought mine, and it's U, the letter, and then Line. But I know that there are also other companies that sell those things, and they tend to sell to museums. That's their main market, but they'll sell to anybody and any quantity or, you know, in any size. So. Yes. Uh, Uline. I, <laughs> <laughs> this is not uh, sponsored by Uline, but they are very fast. Usually right. I get supplies the next day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. And how did you, uh, how did you decide on the silhouette of the garment that you use to display the embellishments through the issue. It's a simple shell for the most part. Right? Yes, yeah. I wanted something that would translate from garment to garment so that um, when you looked at one and then you changed to another, you could sort of say, oh, look, that's kind of bumpy, or, and I really want this to be sleek, or, oh, that's very textured. And that's what I want, so that you could compare things from one technique to another. Oh, that's very smart. I didn't realize that you had thought of it that way. Yeah. And also, I was trying, we did the same thing with the sleeves. At the top of every technique, there's a picture of a sleeve, and the technique is worked on that sleeve. So, and it's it's a real sleeve that goes on a human being or a mannequin, so that you have a sense of the scale of the embellishment. Because in a picture, uh, a seed bead is tiny, but I can blow it up and it can look really big. So you can see the needle passing through it. 
but that doesn't tell you how big it's really going to be in, in real life, as we say. <laughs> so I wanted that to come through as a sense of scale and um, so that you would know, oh, wait, that's going to be too big or that's not going to be big enough. Ellen, one thing that I noticed throughout the book is I really feel that you made an effort to really delve into these embellishments and display them in unique ways. For example, uh, say a beautiful bias um, binding, you didn't just do a neckline or an arm side. You did those special pockets. Are there any other techniques that you really had fun um, coming up with something different or structural for the top? I think all of them. (laughs) Again, I wanted to show them in all of their glory. So, I mean, I I just love doing these things. And so I wanted to say, look at these amazing things that you can do with this simple piece of bias. So you can make it, you know, make a curve. You can also make it go around a piece of um, filler and then make Chinese knots with it. Or you, I mean, there are just a million things you can do with it. And it's all from a piece of fabric that's cut on bias. I just think that's amazing and so fun. So that's sort of guided my exploration into it. The other thing is that there are a million different ways to do each of these techniques. And I wanted to say that in the book. Um, When I was teaching, I would say to my students, okay, I'm showing you this technique and I want you to do your homework this way. You may not like this technique, and that's okay. You need to do it my way, and then you can go off and do it your way after you've done it my way. So the book sort of covers both my way and somebody else's way, and then a third way, if that makes sense, so that people can pick and choose and say, oh, I I really don't like gluing on crystals because I don't like the smell of that glue, so I'm going to stick with the sew-on crystals. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. Here's how to do the sew-on crystals. Now, were there any techniques that you found challenging? I mean, you've been doing this for years, and you love to do this, so I'm wondering if there was was one in here that you you had trouble with or or there was a challenge that you hadn't anticipated. I don't think so. I mean, they all had challenges, mm-hmm. whether it was how to photograph them, how to display them. Um, for me, in many ways, the hardest was the toxin pleats because that involves math. And I can, I'm slightly math challenged, just a little bit. So I could easily get lost in the one plus, uh, you know, I labeled them A, B, C, and D, and I could easily get lost in that A, B, C. Oops, shoot, I didn't put in the D, and so now this pleat doesn't have the underlay. On the other hand, I think um, that I laid it out in a way so that if you're reading through the book and doing it, you're not going to get lost. So the, it's one thing, yes, to put it all together and, and write it out right. for someone. And it's another thing for the person to read it all done and right. <laughs> it's right. all done and it's perfectly fine and right. easy to follow. Yeah. And and that is thanks to Lawrence King and um, my friend Anne, my editor, and also Jody, who was the copy editor. And they sent it out to, I don't even know how many copy editors because I kept getting chapter back, oh, the copy editor found this mistake. I mean, they went through it with a fine-tooth comb over and over and over. They were just fabulous about that. So I adore editors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Ellen, did you, did you think up all these techniques, or did you find them on garments and figure out how to make them or a mix of those? Um, I found them. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was teaching this class... I took it over from somebody else, Mm -hmm. and there were 15 weeks in the semester, and it was all laid out what you were supposed to do in that 15 weeks. And um, to go in that 15 weeks, I um, Xeroxed a lot of different books and pages Mm -hmm. and lots of articles from threads, and um, I put them into a notebook for each student, and it was, you know, this thick. It was two inches thick of, of Xeroxes. 
And they were all written by different voices. And they started in different places. And I thought, this is really not good, which is what Confusing. put me yeah. to writing this book. Yeah. So um, I did not invent anything. It's all stuff that's already out there. Um, but I don't think a lot of people know about it. Because it, we don't make clothes like that anymore, mostly. Right, right. So, so did you have a particular intended audience? Were you thinking of it as potentially a textbook for people who were in fashion design? or I was hoping that it would do both the Threads audience mm -hmm. and the fashion design textbook mm -hmm. audience. Yeah. Um, I had a sort of dual market in mind. It's very pretty for a textbook, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I would take that class. Do you yeah. get to use it in your own teaching now? I do. I do. Oh, good. I'm, I'm teaching a class um, later this fall about um, ribbons. I've called it an afternoon of, of roses, decorative ribbons, and I can't remember the third thing, and bows. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I was trying to make it sound like a tea party. Um, and so I'm going to Xerox the pages from this and make a little handout for everybody and then say, okay, now if you want to go further, you have to go buy the book. Mm -hmm. But part of the class fee is you get the Xerox. So, Did you have a particular palette in mind when you did the issue? How did I've been curious about the fabrics yeah. you used throughout okay. the book. So, again, that goes back to Anne, my editor and friend, who I said, oh, we're going to do every chapter in a rainbow of colors because there's so many beautiful fabrics out there. And she said, oh, no, no, you're going to pick one color for each chapter and do it all the way through. It's going to look much more sophisticated that way. And I said, okay, you know about books. I don't know about writing a book. But she was totally right. And so when she was here from England, when we met the very first time, we went down to my sewing room and we um, made a swatch card for every chapter and for the colors that we didn't have, I had a set of um, Colorade uh, papers. And so we cut those up as well to fill them in so that there was a color progression through the book. And I didn't duplicate too many colors. Um, and it, it just came out beautifully. <laughs> it does look very sophisticated. And yeah. how did you pick the cover garment? They picked that. They picked that. Yeah. It was between this one and the tux um, one, which is all tucked across the front and then tucked yes, across very the... Yes, yeah. yeah. We'll have a picture in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. I, whenever I look at that one, I think of Star Trek uh, Next Generation and the uh, Cardassian warriors who have kind of... It does look a little bit yeah. like armor. Yeah. 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 It's so, beautiful. I love the, the colors in I, the feathers, yes. though. Yeah. yeah. It's really spectacular the whole thing and when I started this I knew a little bit about feathers and now I know a lot about feathers and that was really fun to learn all about feathers and the different birds that they come from and right and that and yeah. those pages in the book really yeah. come through you have a lot of um a lot of good detailed information about about that on yeah. those pages I, I yeah. did enjoy that as well I, I mean that's how I felt about every chapter is I I would start it and I would think oh What's this chapter? And then I'd get into it, and I think, oh, this is cool. This is the best chapter yet. But it was, I mean, it's like your kids when you, you every kid is different, but they're all wonderful. And that's how I feel about every chapter in this book is, oh, they're all so different, but they're really cool and really fun. <laughs> now, did you go to any museums or um any special collections to take a look at how some of the techniques were done or how, you know, the results of some of the embellishments on older garments, for example? I did not. Um, I just kept my head down and I mean, I borrowed a lot of books from the library. So I looked at old books about how they were done and I looked at new, newer books. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that the clothes in museums are kept in low light and all of that stuff so that they're, you know, carefully preserved, but it drives me bonkers because you can't see anything, <laughs> 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 which is, it, that's a really bad excuse for not going to the museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can be hard to get access to the clothes close up anyway. Right. A lot of museums won't let you in to see them that way anyway. And uh, the other thing is that 
we have a lot of different types of materials now that you can use to probably produce things differently from how they would have been done in the 18th or 19th century. You could, I don't know if you use fusibles or anything like that, yeah. but there's a lot of stuff that can, that can make it a whole different process and get a similar result. So, right. Yeah. And I do notice that you do sewing techniques and mm -hmm. hand sewing, you know, machine right. sewing and hand sewing. Right. Um, were you conscious of that, having a balance between those two things when you were choosing the techniques to talk about? N not really. Um, I mean, I didn't exclude machine sewing because I think that there is a place for mach machine sewing. There's also a really good place for hand sewing, um, even basting. I'm a big believer in basting. Um, yes, we are here too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I, th I think they're both important. Well, we've uh, taken up all of our time talking with you, Ellen. Thank you so much. Um, I could talk much more about the book, and we're looking forward to doing some more articles with you. Oh, great. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's been really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with threads.